Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see you all again. And I know that we're all looking forward to seeing more of each other in the weeks and the months to come. I gotta tell you though, uh, I really struggled with this one. How do you preach the first week back after taking a two month break, right? Because I think, you know, after having gone through a global pandemic, maybe we're not all ready to just rush right back into preaching Revelation again, right? And I know the last two sermons of Made Complete uh, in this series, they were a little heavy. And I didn't just want to abandon it though, so I thought maybe we'd continue on with this theme, but then also offer maybe a little bit of hope. Our theme verse, John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's a guarantee, right? Jesus says this as a guarantee. We are going to have tribulation. And sometimes when we look at that, we see it as something that's happening to us, right? Something that's happening to us. We're the victim of the tribulation. We're the recipient. But there are other times when God actually takes you by the hand and says, let's do something together. God partners with you in the tribulation. God says, let's do this together. And most notably, I think of Moses. Moses had a good life, right? Moses was enjoying all the peaks and all the perks of his retirement, but then God calls him out of his retirement. Moses came face to face with a burning bush. And God says in Exodus 3, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God calls Moses to a new plan, a new adventure. And verse 11 starts with the word, but. God says, take my hand, Moses, we're going to start a little trouble in Egypt together. And, you know, I was checking through my list of people that I thought could pull this off with me, and I really can't think of anyone better to do this with than you. And Moses says in verse 13, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Don't you love it? When you ask your kid to do something for you and they say, No, I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's great, God, that you have all these big plans, but in case you didn't notice, I have a nice life here. So yeah, good luck finding someone else to do this because it ain't happening with me. That sounds exactly like my kids. Hey, I need you to do the dishes. I don't want to. Or better yet, tell my brother to do it, right? Just pass the buck to someone else. So this got me thinking about why we even give chores to kids in the first place. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I probably thought, like every other kid, probably said the same thing you said. Uh, I bet you only had kids so that you could have slaves. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought when you were born. You know, I was looking down at your cute little baby face and I said to myself, oh, I can't wait till you can mow the lawn. Why do we give kids chores? Life experiences, builds character, develops problem solving, gives them a sense of independence, uh, being able to do things well, being able to do things on their own. In other words, a child is not complete. They have not fully grown, not fully developed, and so the parent seeks ways to help them grow, mature, become complete. And this is what I see with God and Moses. We've been reading the first couple of verses in the book of James. He says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Moses is not looking at the burning bush as a trial that's going to bring him joy, right? 
Instead, he says, I'm not the guy you're looking for. You see, Moses thought he was retired. He thought he could just live out the rest of his days as a shepherd, working on his father-in-law's huge, massive oasis estate. But God saw more potential in Moses. God saw Moses could be something even more than what he was. God said, Moses, I have a growth opportunity for you. God saw potential for maturity and wholeness, completeness. And Moses says, talk to the hand. Can you even do that to God? Because I think what Moses experiences here with the burning bush, we all secretly want. Haven't you ever come to a fork in the road or a decision and you just wished, you just wished God would talk directly to you and tell you which way to go, right? What, what do I do? Please, God, just grab me by the hand and pull me in the right direction. Moses gets that opportunity and he rejects it. I want that. I want a burning bush moment. And we all know who Moses is, huge historical figure, huge biblical figure, right? There isn't even one story. There's not even one story in the Bible that sums up his life. He has several stories. He's even in the movies. Moses took down Egypt, parted the Red Sea, took millions of people across a desert uh, over to the Promised Land. And the reality is, even Moses, even he, feels inadequate when God calls him to do something. Isn't that the truth? When first asked to go on a mission for God, Moses says no, because he feels that he's not worthy. And why do you suppose he felt that way? Well, remember why he's even in the desert in the first place. I mean, how did he end up in Midian, do you remember? It's because he was banished from Egypt. He was a fugitive. He was an outcast. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 says, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses killed a guy right? Moses lost his temper, killed a guy, and then hid the body. I mean, what would you do if you had an event like that in your past? Moses's biggest struggle was never talking to Pharaoh day in and day out. His biggest struggle wasn't the fact that leadership was thrust upon him. It wasn't even that his wife wasn't Jewish or that he had a speech impediment. Moses' biggest struggle was a struggle that was in his heart. He had a past. He had shame in his past. He had disappointment in his past. Failure, not living up in his past. Moses' greatest battle was a battle that was within. Can you identify with that? I can. You know, the voices, the, the shadow that follows us, that, that, that does more damage and does more to hinder me, more to hold me back than anything else in the physical world. But God sees his struggle and his doubt, and he says, I'm not finished with you, Moses. In fact, I think I might have an assignment that could help you with your confidence and get you out from hiding in this desert. So what happened? God called Moses out of retirement to teach him, to complete him. So that makes me wonder, well, what did Moses, this great leader, lack? What were his shortfalls? Well, the first one is really what we've been talking about. And I, I think it's embarrassment, right? It's embarrassment. What's the number one reason that keeps us all from raising our hand when the teacher asks a question? What's the number one reason that keeps me from standing up first or stepping forward first or volunteering or asking that girl to dance? Embarrassment. That sense of shame. 
that sense of a lack of self-worth. God says to Moses, I've got big plans for you. I believe in you. And Moses says, what does he say in verse 11? Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Because it can't be me, God. I mean, I know you're not talking about me. I'm not a great leader. I'm not even a great shepherd. I'm not a great pastor. I'm not a great dad. I'm not a great husband. I'm not a great employee. Who am I? I mean, look at all these other people. Look at all these other people. I'm sure that you could find somebody better if you just looked. I can't, I can't even keep it all together for me, let alone other people. I'm retired. I just deal, I don't know. I don't need more stress in my life. I know you look down here and you're looking at me and you think, well, he's just sitting by the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away. But I have my own darkness. I have my own sins. Teach Sunday school? Ugh. Lead a home Bible study? What? I, I'm not a superstar Christian, God. I, I, pick a volunteer to help with the youth group. You need to pick somebody else. Maybe it's a past mistake. Maybe it's a past sin. Maybe it wasn't even something you did. Maybe it was something that was done to you. Something that someone did to you, something that someone told you a long time ago and you never forgot it. This voice in your head that makes you ask, who am I? Moses had a damaged past, didn't he? So how did God respond? Verse 11, Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt? And God says, but I will be with you. What was God's answer? I will. That's what God says, I will. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. God didn't even answer Moses' question. Or did he? When we feel inadequate, when we feel incomplete, and then when we ask God, who am I, God, that you should pick me, in response and to help us get past our incompleteness and our shame and to move us towards completeness, what does God say? He said, it's not about you. Who am I, Lord? I can't accomplish this task. And God says, uh, I know you can't accomplish this task. You're not going to accomplish this task. I will. When God calls us to do something and we're embarrassed and we're shy and we're shameful, God reminds us that he will do it. It's not about who we are. It's about who God is. He is bigger than our past. He is bigger than our shame. So God calls Moses to a task. Moses says, I'm not your guy. And God says, don't worry, I will do all the heavy lifting. And then Moses reveals his second shameful excuse. Moses says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and then they ask me, what is his name? What will I say to them? What is Moses' second shortfall? Worry. He has worry about the future. He's worrying about the outcome. What comes next, God, and then what happens? God, I don't know if this plan of yours is going to work. So God has to reassure Moses again. And what is God's response? God says to Moses, I am who I am. Why do we worry about the outcome? Is that our job? Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Matthew 6, 25 says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him. John 14, 1 says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why are there so many verses telling me not to worry? Because my job is faithfulness. My job is obedience. God's job is outcome. Yeah, but what if I try? What if I fail? Oh, well, maybe God was trying to teach you obedience. Maybe God was trying to teach you faithfulness. What if I try and I succeed? Congratulations. 
maybe God was trying to teach you obedience. Listen, we, we can't map out life, all right? We, we can't plan for every contingency. We can't draw up a blueprint for every single thing we try. And my own kids suffer from this. You know, they don't want to try anything new because they're so afraid they can't do it. They're so afraid of failure. You know, but as a parent, I have faith in my kids. I know their abilities. I know they can do it. And I wouldn't ask them to do it. Listen, I wouldn't ask them to rise to the challenge if I didn't think they could. I'm not worried. But that doesn't convince Moses. He still needs more hand-holding. And he's determined to stay in the desert and to stay retired. So he offers up a third excuse, and it reveals a third area of growth in his life. Exodus 4, verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and of tongue. My kids do this to me too. I say, wash the dishes, and they say, I can't do it well. I say, take out the trash, and they say, I don't know how. What is the excuse this time? I don't have the skills. I can't do it. I'm insufficient. I'm inadequate. I am not enough. God, you picked the wrong person. I, I am a shepherd. I'm not a leader. I don't have a degree besides. This is what he's really saying, right? This is what he really says. I'm terrible with crowds and public speaking. You know me. I'm terrible with crowds. I can't, I can't do public speaking. So God responds in verse 11. God says to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? You're reading what I'm reading? All of God's answers are starting to sound the same. Moses throws out a worry, he throws out a concern, and then God responds with, why are you worried? You know, why are you worried about your talents or about what you can do? Who, who made you? God says, I've been equipping you, I've been preparing you, I, I am very aware of what you can do. I mean, let's just think about this for a second. Let's just think about God's decision to call Moses to this task at this point in his life. Who better to go talk to Pharaoh and to make this journey to Egypt and to be the mediator between these two great nations than a man who has been in Pharaoh's presence, knows their governing structure, knows their customs, a man who has lived in the temple, trained by their military, taught by their teachers. Moses was born Jewish and raised Egyptian. He has lived in both of these worlds his entire life. Who is better suited for this job? Moses has been trained since day one for this task, and he can't even see it. God calls him to this amazing opportunity, and Moses says, can you just pick somebody else who's better qualified? And God says, dude, you are the most qualified person on the planet. Your entire life has led up to this moment. Can't you see it? And this is the reason why you were born. This is your moment. I'm calling you to glory. I'm calling you to purpose. I'm, ta I I'm calling you to, to completeness. And you're just sitting there offering up excuses. And I can understand. I mean, I can. I, I really can. It, for me, it's hard for me to blame Moses. Does, does anyone know how long Moses has been in the desert? How long has Moses been in Midian? In, in Midian? How long has he been on the run? How long has he been in Egypt? He, he, he hasn't been in Egypt in 40 years. He's been in the desert for 40 years. So that means he's got a cabin, right? He's got a porch. He's got a rocking chair. He's got animals, a potbelly stove. He takes hikes 
every day. He lives off the land. He's got a couple of hunting dogs and a golf cart. Life is good. Man, life is good. And then God comes along and he says, I think you can be a little bit more. In fact, I think you can be a lot more. I want you to take care of others. I want you to stand up for the oppressed. I want you to help the downtrodden. I want you to lead millions of people. I want you to build a kingdom. Because I see you, Moses. I see you, and I want you to stop hiding behind a life of ease and a life of isolation. Moses lived the retirement life that we are all working towards. He had a ranch out in the country. He had a farm. He was out there for 40 years. That means when the burning bush happens and when God calls him out to this adventure, Moses is 80 years old. Charlton Heston was in his 30s when he played Moses in the movies. And listen, look, it's a great movie. Charlton Heston will always be Moses in my mind, but a 30-year-old knows nothing about being 80 and being retired. What was Moses really saying in all of his excuses? My life is easy. I'm done. I'm settled. My time of adventure is over. I'm retired. Pick somebody else. God says, Moses, there is adventure out there. And Moses says, you got the wrong guy. I'm retired. I'm done. I'm relaxed. I'm settled in. I'm comfortable. I got my good life right here, right how I want it. And God says, hey, you got your marching orders. I'm calling you out of retirement. I know your life. It's neat. It's tidy. I want you to mess it up again. I know your life and you think it's ending, but I'm asking you to start something new. Start over? Ugh. A new project? Now? And this excuse that Moses gives, it's, it's, not a, it's not an age thing. It doesn't have to be an old thing. It could be a young thing too, right? I'm too young. I'm too little. I'm too insignificant. I don't have any pull here. I don't have any sway here. I can't be convincing. I don't have those skills. I don't have that experience, right? Either way we say it, we're saying I'm comfortable right where I am because that's what God is really asking, right? God is asking Moses to leave his porch, to leave his rocking chair, and to give up his life of ease. And we, we don't like giving up anything. God is inviting us to his purpose, to rearrange our priorities for him. Why do we act so surprised? When, when, when these burning bush moments happen in our lives, why do we act so surprised? God has always been a sending God. A God who sends his children out on missions. A God who wants us to go, right? Jesus says in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And our response shouldn't be this long list of excuses. Our response should be exactly what Isaiah says in chapter 6. Here I am, Lord. Send me. What's the reality? The reality is Moses got over his fear. He got over his past. He got over his inadequacies, didn't he? He started off with a long list of complaints and excuses, but he grew and he matured and he led two million people out of Egypt. He helped build a system of law and government. He established a, a whole leadership structure. He led a massive group of people through a very hostile terrain for years. And on his deathbed, recorded, in the Bible for all time, it says this about the legacy of Moses. 
Deuteronomy 34 says, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him, for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. At first, Moses said no. He said, pick somebody else. For that amazing story, Moses almost turned that down because he had a past, because he was retired. But that didn't stop God from calling him to the greatest adventure of his life. And it won't stop you either. Listen, God knows your past. He knows your fears. He knows your inadequacies. And he knows your comfort level. And he knows what scares you. And he knows what stretches you. And he knows where to take you to complete you. The book of Psalm says, For you, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Nobody knows you better. Nobody knows you better than your Heavenly Father. And He's calling you. And you're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too inexperienced. You're not too scared. And you're not too worthless. This is your burning bush moment. And He can use you. And you can do it. He's got you. All you have to do is trust him. Just take his hand and you just begin taking those very first steps of obedience. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. We thank you as our state and our nation begins to reopen and more people are going out into the world. May they experience the joy of community once again. May we experience fellowship once again because we were made for fellowship. We were not made for isolation. You said it was not good that we were alone. You want us out and touching and hugging and loving and extending a hand of grace. Lord, may your church continue to be a light on the hill. May it continue to be a place of refuge and love. May it continue to be a place that welcomes those who are lost and broken. And may it be a place that equips and sends people out because you are a sending God. You are a God who sends for service, who sends for love, who sends for grace. Lord, we just ask that you are with those who are not with us this morning, that you are easing them, comforting fears, restoring confidence, healing, health, and wellness. May we have a great summer and a great rest of the year in this beautiful kingdom that you have prepared for us. And we ask it all in your son's precious name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.